Thank you so much. It's, it's a privilege to be here. This is actually my sending church in 2007. I left from this church with your blessing and moved overseas with my family to change careers drastically. Um, before that, I was had a private counseling practice here in the Concord area. And uh, from there, I've been overseas ever since and now commuting back and forth between overseas and doing a lot of online work when I'm not overseas. So again, I just want to express my deep appreciation and the joy that this church consistently brings to me. Anytime there's a crisis, this church is the first to respond. And what a huge blessing that, that has been throughout um, my time overseas. So thank you. Um, so this story that I'm about to share actually is from my most recent trip, um, just probably a month ago, a month and a half ago. I was on the island of Guam. So I work in all of Micronesia, which is thousands of islands, um, the size of the contiguous United States. So it's huge. If you put all those islands into one landmass, it's smaller than the state of Rhode Island. So that gives you a visual, Micronesia. So on this particular trip, I was working on the island of Guam, and I was working specifically, or the primary target of my work while I was there. If you get my newsletter, you'll get more detail. I'll be sending it out on Tuesday, actually. If you don't get that and you want to get that, um, make sure you give me your email address. So I was doing a lot of counseling at Pacific Islands University, a Christian university uh, um, on the island of Guam. And I was doing a great amount of work with a young lady. I'm going to call her name Isa. I've changed a few details just to protect her identity. Uh, she was born with a developmental disorder uh, that forced her to, to, her eyesight was an issue and she walked with a cane. She also had severe epilepsy. And when she was in school, she would have multiple epileptic seizures a day, coupled with her developmental disorder, warranted her a personal one-on-one -on -one aid. So this aid, instead of being a good thing, she had the same aid all the way through high school, ends up being abusive, both verbally and somewhat physically. The other thing that happened to Isa is she was severely bullied, and this aid would uh, encourage the bullying that she experienced. Um, she also, she, there's multiple layers of trauma for this young lady. She was not from the island of Guam. She was from one of the smaller islands that are next to Guam. And it happened to be an island that is the hated people, uh, different ethnicity from the Guam people. So she also was experiencing bullying because of her ethnicity. She was also experiencing discrimination and prejudice from staff and uh, peers and administration. So again, we've got another layer of trauma. Added to all of this, if that weren't enough, Issa also um, comes from a culture where you do not have intimate conversations. This is pretty much true all through Micronesia. Uh, which is why there's a lot of um, suicide, an extremely high rate of suicide there. It's one of the contributing factors. You do not have intimate conversations with your parents. So there is a, um, when you talk, so I'll just give you a, a something that to me immediately gives you an idea of what that relationship would be like. When you're talking with your parents or a person that you respect, a person of authority, you do not look at them in the eyes. You look at the ground or their feet. So right there, like how much intimacy do you think is going to be between a child and an adult when you have that kind of dynamic that, is take place, that takes place? So Issa's in all this pain. She's being bullied severely and has multiple levels of, of trauma and bullying happening, and she has no one to talk to. So finally, she works up the courage and decides, I'm going to go and talk to my mother. So she goes, she talks to her mother and tells her what's going on. And her mother discounted what Issa said. And she said, I'm sure you're misunderstanding what's happening. I'm sure that your aide in reality is really actually trying to help you and just doing her job. And besides that, 
we really can't say anything. We can't go to the administrators and talk about what's happening because if we do, we're just kind of like the squeaky wheel. We're complaining and we're already hated. So all that's going to do is just make them hate us more. At that point, Issa knew that there was no hope for her. There was no one to protect her. There was no one to share the burden with her, that she was all alone. She became extremely suicidal. She would not be alive today uh, if it weren't for the fact that she has this severe disability that kept her from climbing into a chair, tying a noose, climbing up onto something so that she could hang herself, which is the way Micronesians commit suicide. So she was not physically able to carry out that act, but that's what, then that just made her even more depressed that she couldn't even end her own life. So what would happen then as she got older, she would fall into these deep, um, in, incapacitating uh, times of depression that would last for about a week, maybe two weeks, where she literally wouldn't be able to get out of bed, literally. So she would be in bed, wouldn't be able to eat, would have no self-care whatsoever, um, wouldn't be able to uh, do any schoolwork. And so this created an academic um, visual. In terms of, if you looked at her record, she was very, very intelligent, one of the most intelligent, maybe actually the most intelligent person I've ever done counseling with in Micronesia. So she would, would have straight A's, and then all of a sudden you would see F's because she would disappear. She wouldn't be in class and she would be, not be able to turn one thing in because she couldn't function during these bouts of depression. And so that is how she ended up in my counseling office was a caring uh, staff at PIU, a professor, noticed that Issa had all A's, then all F's, then all A's, all F's. Well, you can't get away with that in college, at the college level, because you'll just end up failing. So the, the professor is very concerned and says, why don't you go and talk to Karen? So Issa comes in. This was very courageous. <clears throat> it's very hard for Micronesians to trust. Um, and so this was a newer student who didn't really know me. So this showed incredible um, courage on her part. So Issa came in, and uh, after hearing her story, I said to Issa, you know, Issa, I would like for you to picture yourself at a young age, like maybe, I don't know, second grade, first grade, during the bullying years. And so she's picturing herself, and then she blurts out, I hate that girl. So right then that told me that Issa had internalized all of the lies being fed to her her whole life, that she was not valuable, that she was not worthy of love, um, that she was, had, was not a cherished person. And the Bible says that Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and he comes to destroy. And that's what I most, I love my, the therapy part of my job, is that I believe that when we take psychological best practices and you couple that with biblical and spiritual truth, it, there is a synergistic effect that is unbelievably powerful. It is profound, and I get to participate with God in that, um, that, that synergistic effect, watching that happen in the, in the counseling room. And so what I was doing during that work which was grueling work, sometimes three-hour-long sessions at a time, is trying to extrapolate those lies, get them into the light, because Satan wants to keep all that in the darkness. So working and working to get all that she had, all the lies she'd internalized, and to get that out onto the table, get it into the light. And eventually, Issa does begin to understand that she is cherished and loved by God. Again, this was not easy work, but um, it, eventually we got there. And during the last session that I had with her, I was doing a, a technique to lower trauma because this, she has not only all those lies, but actual P PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as a result of extreme bullying and years of that um, on top of each other, multiple um, traumas. So I'm doing a, a trauma technique with her, 
And all of a sudden, her eyes shoot open, and she says to me, I, I can breathe. Well, I think, oh, I sure hope so. <laughs> and, but she's like in awe and shock. I mean, it was all over her face. And she just keeps repeating, I'm, I'm breathing. I'm breathing. I can breathe. And she said, it's like for all these years, as young, like, like right when I entered school, I haven't been breathing. It's, it's like my breath has been constricted. There's been chains wrapped so tightly around my chest that I haven't been able to take full breaths. And she's like, I, I'm breathing. And again, I, I just will never forget the awe and amazement and wonder on her face. And then she goes on to say, and it's like there was chains wrapped around my legs and my torso, and I can feel those chains, they're loosening, and some of them are falling off. So that was the very last session, very end of, the, of the, our time together. And as she gets up and walks out of my room, she was practically glowing, like radiating with joy and wonder and awe as she, you know, with her cane, makes her way out of the counseling room. So this morning we read already the text, Matthew 18, 23 through 35, which is a parable that was recorded by Matthew, who is a follower of Jesus. And Jesus is telling this story, and it's at the end of his ministry. He knows that this is right before the crucifixion. He has critical information that he's trying to convey to his closest followers, specifically the disciples. So I think that um, you've heard the, the, the uh, parable already. Generally, I intercept right after the scripture of that scripture is read, I intercept um, <clears throat> because I'm the one that reads it right now at this point. And the reason why I intercept and stop immediately afterwards is I believe that when we hear the word forgiveness, many people are really kind of triggered by that, that we have so many preconceived notions about what forgiveness is, that we, are, we get super anxious, um, we have put all these projections onto that, and I believe it can interfere with the Word of God. And I'm very concerned about that as we proceed, is I want nothing to interfere with what God wants us to hear this morning. So I'm just going to stop and quickly pray before we proceed. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would calm our hearts, that you would quiet our minds, that you would give us ears to hear, that by the power of your spirit, the truth of your word would prevail against anything opposing it, including our physical selves. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The second thing I'm going to do to try to mitigate, to lower the, um, the strong reactions that anyone in here might be having is to very quickly, and I'm talking ripping right through this because there's not time, I'm going to say 10 things that forgiveness is not in an attempt, again, trying to lower the anxiety and the misinformation that might interfere. So again, I'm going to fly through these. I encourage you to take out your cell phone, snap a picture of this, because I've had multiple people. I, pr I talked about this at another church, and everyone was asking me afterwards, I really wanted to write those down, and you went too fast. So if you want to have this information, I encourage you to take a picture of the screen. Forgiveness is not putting yourself in a position to be hurt over and over again. It is not forgetting what happened to you. Forgiveness does not mean minimizing the seriousness of the offense. Forgiveness does not mean condoning or excusing the offense. It is not instant trust if trust has been broken. It is not the absence of anger. Righteous anger may be appropriate. Forgiveness is not squelching conflict. Forgiveness does not mean that legal action or legal justice is ignored. Forgiveness is not instant Forgiveness does not always mean reconciliation. So now that we've got that out of the way, we'll have a, yep, um, we we're going we're gonna to jump into the parable. As Jesus spoke, the disciples would have immediately known that the king, 
again, I'm going back to what was read to you earlier, that the king represented God. They would have known that because in Jewish parables, the king always represented God. Likewise, they would have known that debts represented sin. So this parable starts off with a king who wants to, um, the next slide shows this, wants to settle accounts with his servants. One particular servant owed him an extraordinary sum of money. This servant was probably a satrap, which was a provincial governor who served the king by ruling on his behalf in a specific province of the kingdom. Uh, in this, um, this particular satrap would have been held against his will, but he was probably a very trained and educated gentleman. Um, he ha would have had an unusual freedom and privilege. Uh, a, a parallel to this guy would have been Daniel in the book of Daniel, who was kidnapped from his country and served an administrative role to the king. So very similar to that. In this case, this satrap was collecting taxes, which he then turned over for the royal treasury. The phenomenal amount of money that he owed substantiates the idea that he was collecting taxes for, for the king, for a big region. It also reeks of embezzlement. Recognizing that there was no way the servant could pay him back, the king, in our, in our, in our parable, the king says, okay, well, I would like to get some money back at least. So he did something that was very common during that era. It was totally legitimate legally for him to, to do this. And that is he said, okay, I'm going to sell the guy's any property he has, his estate, his possessions, his wife, his children, and himself. And so then he would, with that, he'd be able to get a little bit of what he was owed back. So you think of like an estate sale that included the people. Kind of weird, but that's what it was. Okay? So don't think of American slavery. This was not American slavery. These were people who would have been working as indentured servants. So there's a chance that ultimately they could work off what they owed. You may ask, well, how much exactly was the king owed? We're told that the servant owed 10,000 talents. The talent was a unit of money, and I've decided the easiest way to demonstrate its value is to present it in present-day U.S. currency figures. Now, I've taken this to specifically to the area where I live, which is Santa Barbara County, and according to the U.S. Census Bureau, as of a couple years ago, the median Santa Barbara household income was just shy of 100000 so if you take one talent, one talent is equivalent to 20 years wages. So using that Santa Barbara number, that would have been basically $2 million in today's money. Okay? But that's one talent. The servant owed 10,000 talents. So this is $20 billion in today's money. It's really important that you grasp that. 20 crazy billion dollars. Now, when Jesus' disciples would have heard this, you have to understand, he would have had, they would have had the same reaction that you're having right now. Like, what the heck? That is a boatload of money. That's a crazy amount of money, right? They would have been shocked, just like we are. Uh, the annual revenue of Herod's kingdom was 900 talents. Now remember, this guy owed 10,000 talents. So the annual revenue of King Herod's kingdom was 900 talents. So the servant owed the king more than 10 times the annual revenue of King Herod. Again, shocking, right? That was why Jesus chose that number. He's trying to shock, give, make it so crystal clear that there is no possible way that this servant could even pay back a small amount of that. There's, there's nothing. Like the king, he's history. He's out that money. So hearing that all, that he and all his possessions were to be sold, the, the servant's freaking out. He doesn't want to have him and he and all his possessions and estate and family sold due to failure to pay. So he falls on his knees begging for mercy. And he then makes this audacious claim. He says, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Okay, that is a big, fat joke. 
pay you everything? <laughs> okay, so like the, it's, a, it's like a major joke, okay? Uh, this, it would take that servant 200,000 years to pay back. And that's if he gave the king 100% of every single thing he made between then and the 200,000 years. It's not going to happen, right? It's almost insulting that he would say that to the king, to me, in my opinion. So regardless of how preposterous his assertion is, the king, it's fascinating to me to watch the king's response to this. He doesn't do what I would do, which would, again, feel really insulted, like, what, everything? Yeah, right. I mean, how do you even have the, the gall to say that to me after you just extort- did all this extortion and messed me over so badly, and then you, 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 like, you should just be begging, saying, I'll give you everything I can or whatever, I, but I, I could never pay it back. I've been so bad. We, even though the servant doesn't do any of that, look at the king's response. Without qualifiers, without anything, the king just lets the servant go. Carte blanche. I absolve you. You're free of your debt. See ya. Okay. So the, the, the servant now is walking out. I'm sure he's just practically glowing and radiating with his good fortune and thinking, how in the world did I just get $20 billion just absolved and given to me. But just then, his eyes lock on to another servant who owes him. He would have been a day laborer probably. And the, this servant owed him a hundred denarii. Day laborers were paid one denarius a day. So servant two owes servant one the equivalent of a hundred days labor. Or in current Santa Barbara currency, that would be 33000 $400. The first servant, oh, now, I, uh, I um, need to thank Stephanie Soltero, who's a brilliant mathematician, who came up with this great idea of showing it as a ratio. So she said that servant one owed three, would be like three million dollars for a house, and servant two, two owed him five dollars for a cup of coffee. Okay, there's your ratio. Or we could say servant two owed him $20 for a meal at In-N-Out Burger. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's very popular in Southern Cal. Um, do, you have, do you have it? I know, I should have sh- just said Chick-fil-A, right? Okay, at, compared to servant one who owes the guy $12 million for, uh, for a house. Okay. So there's your ratio again. So grabbing servant two by the neck, the next slide, he grabs him by the neck and he begins to choke him while demanding payment. Servant two pleads with nearly the exact same phrase. The next slide shows that. Um, And he says, have patience with me and I will pay you. Now that's really legit because it was like a third of a year's uh, wages is what he owed him. So that would have been a doable thing to pay back. But oh no, servant one has no patience. He grabs the guy and he throws him into debtor's prison, which is the worst possible thing you can do to somebody who owes money. Because once you're in debtor's prison, you can't make money. So that's like pushing you in, shutting the door and throwing out the key, locking it and throwing out the key. You're not ever gonna get out because you have no means of making money to get out. So it was an incredibly cruel thing to do. But there are other servants nearby who, upon seeing this, freak out, and they go running to the king and report to him what's, what's going on. And based on his response, I'm assuming that the king was furious. In the original Greek, he calls servant number one a scoundrel, and he throws him into debtor's prison. Even though the parable ends with such shocking imagery, it actually fits the servant's shocking behavior. Before we move on, it's important and it's critical that we understand that Jesus isn't presenting formal theological instruction about judgment or the nature of eternity. We know this because the word jailer means torturer, and God does not have torturers. This outrageous imagery is meant to reflect servant number's one outrageous behavior. 
That's what that's all about. And speaking of the first servant, next slide, who acts like this? Actually, it's the next one after that. Who acts like that? I mean, who in one moment experiences lavish and ridiculous, unwarranted carte blanche freedom from $20 billion and then turns around to demand repayment of a comparatively insignificant amount of money from someone else. You can go to the next slide. That would be like Isa when she exited my office, just like glowing with all of the healing and her release from bondage and filled with confidence. And um, since she no longer was chained to the lies of worthlessness, it would be like her feeling empowered as she exits, exits my counseling office, sees one of the um, people, it's a blank slide, it sees one of the um, people who used to tease her somewhat in elementary school, and she pick, picks up her cane and just starts beating that, that person and verbally abusing the person for all they'd done to her, completely forgetting about the unimaginable healing that she had just experienced. That would be tragic. So again, I respond, really? Who does that? Who acts like this? Well, let me put it this way. If the king represents God, the servant represents us. Maybe not always, but our very nature is to sometimes act like servant number one. We luxuriate in God's forgiveness to us, but we stubbornly hold on to our grievances against others. And some of us are certainly owed enormous debts, offenses and hurts and injustices that are just that. Believe me, I know. You can't do counseling for over 30 years and not have heard probably pretty much everything. But I also know that I believe we want to forgive. We long to let go. We too f want to feel like the chains have fallen off of us and that we can breathe again. And I also know that forgiveness is a journey. And it begins by reflecting on the character of the king. So we're going to look at three reflections on the character of God, our king. The first one being that God, our king, is compassionate. I love how scripture says that the king felt pity for the begging, ridiculous um, first servant. I love it when I'm reading scripture and I see a, uh, anything that talks about God feeling. Uh, it's so cool because to me that really reveals um, the intimacy of God, the connection, the deep connecting God, the God who, f who understands our feelings and created feelings. So anytime I read a feeling word in scripture, I'm like white on rice. I am all over that and just analyzing it and looking at it. So in this, uh, it talks about how God felt pity. This shows a king whose nature is one of compassion, mercy, and patience. Verse 27 says that out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt. The word pity can be translated compassion. Means, it means to be moved in your gut, in your innermost self. It's the same word that's used in the story of the prodigal son. When the father sees his son disheveled and not in good condition and done who knows what, he sees him off in the distance and he sees him returning home and feeling that deep compassion even in that state that he's in, and after all that he'd done, the, the father feels this deep compassion, same word, arms open wide, takes off running, something culturally very bad to do, takes off running after his son. Again, it's that beautiful word of compassion. As one guy put it, in this text, Jesus is describing the very heart of God. When God sees a person bound in debt with no options before him, he is moved with compassion, and he comes and he absorbs the debt and says, you're forgiven. 
I release you. So think about it. The king could have said, you've swindled me out of a boatload of money. So I want to at least get something back from this. So we're going to like set up some kind of a payment plan. Uh, how about we'll take the $20 billion you owe me and you're responsible for 10% of it. Or you're, how about we set up this plan where you give me 20% of all your checks that come in, your, pay, your uh, work, whatever they're called, <laughs> for, from he, now until you die, until you're not working. You don't see any of that. You see no um, qualifiers and, and s things that are required. Instead, he just simply completely frees him of his debt. He cancels the whole thing. This is a staggering act of compassion. The next thing we see about God is that he's a God of forgiving. The enormous debt of human sin is truly incom incomprehensible. The first servant's response is ridiculous with his claim that he will pay back everything. Remember, that's going to take 200,000 years. I don't think he's going to live that long. Uh, one preacher I heard talked about how utterly foolish this servant's statement must have sounded to the king. But our attempts to pay back our equally astronomical debt by being good enough, going to church enough, giving enough money, doing enough charity, that's equally stupid. It must sound so foolish to a, a holy God. In the Old Testament, there was an emphasis on holiness, and the rules and the laws to achieve holiness simply illuminated how impossible it is to achieve. I resonate with King David when in uh, Psalm 51.3 he says, my sin is ever before me. That is t completely true with me. It's very depressing to just uh, try to achieve holiness or to be good enough to do any of these things on my own power. It's impossible. Perhaps, but perhaps most of us have a hard time accepting that we're debtor number one. You see, we see ourselves, myself included, this is my tendency, to see myself as debtor number two, thinking, I don't know that much. I mean, I'm not that bad. I've never killed anyone. I'm essentially a good person. But that's Old Testament thinking. I've done pretty good. I've followed the laws, the rules, all of that. Old Testament thinking. But God is not like us. He is utterly, completely, and perfectly holy, as in 100%. Not one shred of impurity is in him. Every action and every thought he has, faultless. He is separate from all evil, 100% blameless. In the Old Testament book of Amos, the analogy is used of a plumb line. And a plumb line uses a weight. You have a string up here tied somewhere. It has a weight at the bottom, and it seeks the center of the earth, indicating the true vertical direction it makes for a perfectly straight line. Perfectly straight line. Now, I don't know if you, any of you have ever tiled I've had the unfortunate experience of when we lived here, we had a major fixer-upper house, and I had to tile three bathrooms. So tiling, besides being horrible for your hands and your fingernails, it is meticulous work. So you have to start off with this perfectly straight line. That's critical. Your whole job depends on this. And if you, when you place that tile, if it's not perfectly aligned to that plumb line to that line, but like off just maybe the, maybe the top part by one millimeter. And then the next one is off by one millimeter. And the next one, this is what you'll end up with. If you can see where the lines don't, aren't lined up, some are wider than the other, you end up with plumb re, re, results of crooked tiles and uneven grout lines. Not a good situation. But interestingly, it's Jesus, not the Old Testament, who says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Big problem we've got. Our holy God expects holiness in every part of us too, in our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our aspirations, our dreams. But our lines, we aren't aligned perfectly to him. We're like that tile, just a little off. We don't match up. 
one man remarks, Jesus wants us to see how we think that the crimes against us are far greater than the crimes that we've committed against God. God says, nope, you owe more than you realize. He tells us that we are the debtor with the $20 billion in debt. Yet God, next slide, magnanimously forgives with no conditions based on the self-sacrificial payment made in our name by the speaker of this parable. Paul wrote in Colossians 2, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And this is where you and I are part of this parable because the third uh, characteristic of God, our king, is that God holds us accountable. We inherit an obligation to forgive others from the grace we have received. We forgive, Earl Palmer wrote, because we are first forgiven which means that we learn about how to forgive from the king himself. And the greatest debt we owe to that wealthy king is the imperative that we do not forget his forgiveness toward us. Grace always brings with it responsibility. We are meant to mirror God's mercy. Using our parallel money figures, going back um, to what I talked about earlier in Santa Barbara, the second servant, he owed $33,400. That's not chump change, right? That's significant. Some people really are indebted to us. But here's the part we must not miss. This is the critical statement. The king had just forgiven the first servant $20 billion. And the king makes this statement. You should have had mercy as I had mercy on you. That's the critical statement of this entire sermon. You should have had mercy as I had mercy on you. I love the way a pastor I heard discusses this specific statement there. And that is that Jesus is fundamentally shifting and redirecting the core motivation of forgiveness. Forgiveness in our minds is distributed based on the person's worth, the person's worthiness. Are they really sorry? Are they truly repentant? How am I feeling about them and what they did? Have they, you know, done something to make me feel like they're truly repentant? Um, How am I feeling right now? We go through all these different qualifiers, and then we decide, well, I suppose I'll forgive you. But no, no, no. Jesus says, when you want to deal with an offense and you are considering offering forgiveness, don't look at the person. Don't look at the problem. Don't look what was done. Look at the cross. Yeah, but look what they did to me. Look at how I'm still dealing with blah, blah, blah. They lied to me. They, they stole from me, etc. But Jesus says, Forgive according to what you have received, not according to what they deserve. Get your eyes off of that. If you do that, you will find you have the capacity to be gracious. I heard a story recently about a traveler in Burma who was you know, go, traveling all over the land, going this way and that way. And at, when he went through one particular river, when he comes out, he's got leeches all over, the, all over him, and they're busy sucking at his blood. And his first impulse was to tear those torture tormentors off of him, right? He just wants to tear them off. And the guide, hurt, hurt, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. Because what will happen if you do that, just force that, a sheer force and determination, yank those things off, you could leave little pieces still in you. And it could poison, cause poison all throughout your body. It's very dangerous. You don't want to do that. Look, at, I, I, I know exactly what to do in this case. Just trust me. So the guide goes back. 
and he creates a bath and he gets all these special herbs and he puts the herbs into the bath and he says to the traveler, just, just soak in this bath water and you watch what will happen. Just relax, just get in that water, get yourself really fully immersed, soaked, and just hang out in that water, just soak, soak in that. And as he lie, lay down in that water and was soaking, sure enough, the leeches, one by one, just f- fell right off. Each unforgiven injury rankling in our hearts is like leeches sucking at life, our life's blood. Mere human determination to get rid of them, to yank them off, just using, using sheer force or will, will not cast the evil things away. You must bathe your whole being in God's pardoning mercy. And these venomous creatures, the, the unforgiveness, the resentments, will instantly let go of their hold and you will stand up free. Then watch God's cleansing work change your heart toward those who have offended you. Because at the end of the day, there is nothing more glorious than saying, I I can breathe. I can breathe. I can feel the chains falling off of me. They're loosening. They're falling off. I can freely breathe. To be forgiven absolutely is a gift but it's also a gift to forgive. Let's pray. Dear God, we are in awe of your forgiveness that we do not deserve. Help us to, with your power, help us to really uh, soak in that, to soak in you, to be in your presence and to understand how much you have freed us from, how we are so far from your plumb line, and yet you freely forgive. Give us that kind of grace to be able to forgive those who have wronged us. We need you, God. We are hurting and broken people who desperately need your goodness and your power. Empower us by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.